Okay, welcome back everyone. This is lecture number eight and uh, we're going to talk about cellular transport mechanisms. So let's review what solutions are. Solutions have two parts, the solvent and the solute. And the definitions of those are kind of reciprocal and so they sound a little redundant. The solvent is what does the dissolving and the solute is what gets dissolved. So if you think of most solvents, it's usually water although with hydrophobic substances, it's a type of oil or lipid. Okay, so remember I talked about the concentration gradient. Remember that the more you have on one side of the membrane, the faster the concentration gradient moves until you hit equilibrium. When Before it's met equilibrium, you often talk about the solution that whatever you're talking about is in by the term tonicity. In a hypertonic solution, the solution has a greater concentration of the solutes on the outside of the cell membrane. For example, if a cell from a freshwater fish is placed into a beaker of salt water, the cell would shrink. That's also called crenation. In an isotonic solution, the solution has equal concentrations of solutes on both sides of the cell membrane. So there's no net movement of water, but water is always moving in and out. Um, it's just moving in and out at the same rate. And finally, with hypotonic solutions, they have a lesser concentration of the solute on the outside of the cell. So this is the same thing as if we took a saltwater fish's cell and placed it in a beaker of fresh water. The cell would burst because plasmolysis occurs. Um, plasmolysis, lysis means to break apart, and plasma means cell, um, the cell cytoplasm. If it's a plant cell and has a cell wall to prevent it from bursting, it would become turgid, and so they'd actually kind of bur you know, bulge out at the seams. When we talk about movement of water across a cell membrane, we refer to it as osmosis. And this is a definition that I do want you to actually know almost word for word. It is the net movement of water through a selectively permeable membrane from an area of higher water concentration to an area of lower water concentration until equilibrium is reached. The term osmosis is only used referring to water. So you can't learn by osmosis. Um, and so let's take a look at osmosis in action. When we talk about isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic solutions, usually what we're talking about is movement of the water molecules itself across the cell membrane. So in an isotonic solution, remember the water is moving in and out at the same rate. So there's no net movement. And so this is a red blood cell, um, both a scanning electron micrograph and a diagram that shows the normal concave, biconcave disc shape of the cell, uh, red blood cell. So the water moves in and out. In a hypotonic solution, it swells and eventually bursting can occur or by plasmolysis. And in a hypertonic solution, the water moves out into the solution because the water is following the salt. It's trying to balance out the water on both sides of the cell membrane. So water follows the salt. If there's more salt inside, it goes inside. If it's, there's more salt outside, it goes outside. So if the water leaves the cell, you can see that it shrivels and that's called crenation. If we're not talking about water, and it's a passive process, we're often talking about diffusion. This is the movement of stuff. In this case, I say very small particles, but you can just generalize and call it stuff. From an area of higher concentration of the stuff to an area of lower concentration of the stuff with the concentration gradient. In other words, it's going from high to low. That's important to notice because with the trans concentration gradient isn't always the case. So let's take a look at diffusion. So we start out and we have that high concentration in one little corner and then it spreads out until it's evenly distributed inside the box. There are other types of passive transport. Channel mediated transport uses a membrane bound protein to allow slightly larger molecules across the membrane. So remember I said usually only small molecules can go with diffusion but slightly more larger ones can go through channels. Carrier mediated transport uses specific receptor proteins to allow molecules to pass the membrane, but both of these go with the concentration gradient. So they're going from low to high, and it's passive because it does not require energy. That's different from active transport. 
all cell membranes show selective permeability, which means that some substances can cross and others cannot. Membrane barriers and crossing are vital to the cell's capacity to increase, decrease, and maintain concentration of molecules and ions required for cell metabolism. In the passive transport, material passes from the interior of the transport proteins without an energy boost, and this is also known as facilitated diffusion. But in active transport, proteins become activated to move a solute against the concentration gradient. So in other words, going from low to high now. Substances can move in bulk across the cell membrane by exocytosis and endocytosis as well, which is actually taking parts of the whole membrane. When water-soluble molecules bind to transport proteins, they trigger changes in the shape that ease the solute through the protein and hence through the membrane. In active transport, to move the ions and large molecules across a membrane against a concentration gradient, special proteins are induced to change shape in a series, but only with an energy boost of ATP. An example of active transport is the sodium-potassium ion pump of the neuron membrane and the calcium pump of many other types of cells. And you can see here that these are all in a big cycle. Membrane traffic can also happen to and from the cell's surface, and these are endocytosis and exocytosis. In exocytosis, cytoplasmic vesicles, which are produced in the Golgi bodies, move substances from the cytoplasm to the plasma membrane, where the membranes of the vesicles and cell membrane fuse together. They're made of the same stuff, so when they touch, they join and make a bigger uh, membrane. So when they fuse together, it releases those particles into the outside environment. Endocytosis does the opposite. It encloses particles in small portions of the plasma membrane to form vesicles that move into the cytoplasm and go to various spots. In receptor-mediated endocytosis, specific molecules are brought into the cell by specialized regions of the plasma membranes, which form coated pits that sink into the cytoplasm. Phagocytosis is an active form of endocytosis by which a cell engulfs microorganisms, particles, or other debris. This is seen in protestins like amoebas, but it's also seen in your white blood cells, and this is how they fight bacteria. They actually suck it in, engulf it, and digest it. In bulk phase endocytosis, a vesicle will form around a small volume of extracellular fluid without regard to what substances may be dissolved in it. So it's just kind of a random process. And then the cell engulfs it. Even as exocytosis and endocytosis disrupt the plasma membrane, the rates are such that the plasma membrane is continually replaced. In other words, what comes in and sucks out part of the plasma membrane gets replaced by exocytosis. For example, in neurotransmitter release, an episode of exocytosis was immediately followed by counterbalancing endocytosis. So we actually have um, clinical data that shows that this happens constantly. Okay, so that's kind of a brief overview of different types of transport mechanisms across the cell membrane. You will need to know these in fairly good detail, so make sure that you're reviewing these materials and also reviewing the definitions for the keywords that you can find on the note sheet for this lecture. Um, if you have any questions, again, see me during office hours. I'll be happy to help you or send me an email. If not, have a fantastic day.